It's like a really funny thumbnail. Okay, um, I like to make myself laugh. It's very efficient. I don't have to rely on other people. Okay, so there are a lot of funny people in the world. Back in Trade La La One, I'm happy to report everything is fine here. So we got our uh, test review sheet here. I saw some remind comments. Um, you know, now that I think about it, I didn't see your comments on YouTube, so I don't know how that worked out. On the whole, I'm feeling good about this process because I had 37 views, so that seems good, um, since there's not that many people in the class. Um, I just can't see the comments. Live chat replay. Hmm. So, I think if I, as I'm going through the review sheet, if you have more questions, then hopefully that will um, give you a chance to ask me. Let me make sure I have live chat on here. Top chat. No, I want live chat. Okay. So now I think we're good to go. All right. So your test is on unit one. Here's your review sheet. I printed it off of the website. I think that we will talk about those documents in order as they occurred historically let me think about that yeah okay so your book starts out with um the perspectives of po political scientists and there's pluralism elitism hyperpluralism okay pluralism is the idea that there's going to be factions in society that are self-interested it's an optimistic point of view that hey no problem Sure, there's going to be self-interested factions, and they're going to um, all form groups, and those groups are going to bring their influence to bear on elected leaders, and the elected leaders are going to be enlightened, fabulous people, and they're going to take all that into account and make enlightened decisions that serve the interests of everyone. So um, that's the ideal that's, that Madison believed in when he, we founded the Republic, is that pluralism would prevail. And that therefore all these factions would balance each other out, there'd be freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and um, it would all work out. So elitism is a point of view that says, yeah, that didn't really work out. And the reason that didn't work out is because um, we've combined representative democracy with capitalism and elections where money is really important. And so money has corrupted politics. And now people with more money have more voice and are attended to more often and their policy objectives are met. And so there's this whole kind of corrupt shift towards moneyed interests and those are the factions that rule. And the people, the majority of people who are not fabulously wealthy don't have equal access to influence their elected representatives. And so we've kind of perverted the um, original model. Not in like a sexual way, <laughs> like just it's not the way it was intended. Okay, and then we have um, hyperpluralism. So hyperplural elitism is kind of a point of view I, I think that is more typical of liberals who kind of uh, are wary about um, class and um, wealth and corporate interests. Okay, and then um, we have hyperpluralists who believe that. Um, we have another problem, which is that government has grown too big and too unwieldy. The scope of government, meaning the number of things they're concerned in and the amount of things they're doing, has only grown because elected officials want to say yes to everyone. Because if you say yes to everyone who comes before you, all these self-interested factions, that those self-interested factions will help get you elected because you've said yes. But what it means is that you just say yes to a whole lot of things. And uh, that means that government grows and grows and grows and grows and sometimes does things in conflict with each other that actually don't make sense um, for government to be doing both of those things, like subsidizing tobacco farmers and regulating um, and trying to cut tobacco use. Okay, um, th that's an example in the book. Okay, so hyperpluralists tend to think that government has not worked out the way it was intended by the founders because it's too big and too unwieldy because there's this attempt on elected officials to make everyone happy and just keep saying yes. All right, so um, 
our first government, uh, well, we, we can't get ahead of ourselves here. Our, before our first government, we had the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so we were British colonies, and you know all the little build up to that, where we were colonies, and we fought the French and the Indians in the West, and as a result, we ran up this debt. We, the British supported us in fighting against the French and the Indians here in North America, and we won, but we had this debt, so the British started trying to tax us to pay back the debt, and also they started trying to control our trade for mercantilism, and that's make sure that the colonies sell raw materials and the mother country sells manufactured goods. And We just chafed, particularly um, our founding fathers, who were kind of upwardly mobile middle class, upper middle class people. They started chafing underneath all of this control, and we had a history of town meetings and self-governance here in the colonies. And so over time, we decide that we need to um, declare our independence. So the Declaration of Independence is an important founding document. It's one of the 10 you have to know on the test. It is written by Thomas Jefferson, and it includes within it some of the key political philosophers from the Enlightenment, their key ideas, okay? So remember how the Declaration of, In of Independence begins. It starts with when in the course of human events, and it basically says um, that we have natural rights. It was kind of understood by most of the founding fathers that those natural rights were as a result of nature, which was another word of talking about God, had created humans and that breathed into them as natural conditions were life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness. A lot could call it property. And um, as a result, that you can't take those things away from people, that the government has to protect people's life, liberty, and property, their natural rights. That is a Locke idea, Lockean, John Locke, okay? Um, then we add um, some Rousseau onto that, which is the whole idea of the social contract, okay? Rousseau came after Locke and he said um, that if the government isn't protecting your rights, then you have a duty to overthrow it because it's an unjust government, okay? So that's important in the Declaration of Independence because they basically say, hey, we have natural rights, the British government is not protecting our rights. Then, in true Enlightenment fashion, they produce all their proof and kind of like a scientific equation or something. They list all the grievances they have against the king, specifically he, 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 he. And so um, they, they prove with evidence their claims. That's also very Enlightenment thinking and scientific method. And then they um, announce that they're officially separating from uh, Britain and they pledge their lives, their sacred fortunes and their honor to that cause, which means they're all willing to die for that claim and cause. Um, so that is the Declaration of Independence. It's very different than the Constitution. Nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about natural rights. Nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about you have the right to overthrow your government. But these are fundamental ideas kind of in the American mind about government from that time forward. We win the American Revolution and we our first government is the Articles of Confederation and as you know they were not so great. Okay, They made the states much too strong. There was taxes between states and therefore there was little trade that could go on within the United States uh, because it was too expensive to trade across all those borders. Um, the federal government could raise an army, but they couldn't tax to pay for it, and so they ended up really practically having to take donations and volunteers, and we all know how that probably worked out. It did not work out well. Uh, they did give the federal government the power to negotiate treaties. Um, remember, they had one branch of Congress, only one branch. There was no judicial branch. There was no executive branch. Um, so there's no way to, dis to settle disputes between states. Um, Y'all did that Venn diagram about the Articles and the Constitution. Constitution, the things they had in common, things separate. So if you'll look over that, I think we can save ourselves some time here. Um, remember that the Articles of Confederation go on for a long time. You had 9 out of 13 to pass a law. You had to have unanimous 13 out of 13 support to amend the Articles. And in time, it just becomes clear that they are not providing a, a, a strong enough federal force. So these rebellions break out. In North Carolina, it was called the Regulator Revolt. In Virginia, it was called Bacon's Rebellion. The most famous one was in Massachusetts. It was called Shays Rebellion, where the poor people um, have been taxed more than the rich people, and they're not being provided protection. And now their farms are getting taken away because they're in foreclosure because they can't pay their debts because the wealthy are controlling the money supply and they're underprinting money. 
All that leads them to rebel and start burning down courthouses and places where deeds to property are stored. And this leads our founding fathers to be very upset about the fact that their property might, their ownership of property might come into question or might be redistributed or those things. And so finally, when James Madison invites people for a second time to come meet and try and amend the articles, they do come to Philadelphia in 1786 and they start, um, 1787 is when the constitution's done and they start, over, they decide to overthrow the government peacefully and then write this new constitution that we uh, is now the basis of our government. And it will be argued throughout that whole summer and finally pounded out and it will need to be ratified. It needs to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. At first it was only ratified by 11 and then Rhode Island and North Carolina came on board when the Anti-Federalists insisted that there be a Bill of Rights added because there are no rights specifically for the people in the Constitution except a few like protections against habeas corpus protections which means that you have to be presented with charges of imprisoned and no bills of attainder and no ex post facto law. Those are the only protections uh, for individual rights in the Constitution. So the Bill of Rights will be added the first 10 amendments and that will help solve that problem. Okay, so Hobbes is the one thing we haven't talked about so far. Hobbes came before Locke and Hobbes and Locke had very different points of view about human nature. Hobbes thought humans were really kind of evil and self-serving and that before there was government, they lived in a constant state of paranoia and war with each other. And so he thought government was better than that, no matter what the government was like. And he wasn't real picky about what the, what the government was going to be like. In fact, he kind of thought people were great beasts and you needed a strong government. So he wasn't that tied up into natural rights and protecting natural rights. He was more about order. Then Locke comes after him and he does not think human nature is as evil. He does think that government can make life better because it'll help solve disputes and you won't have to like carry out revenge killings every time someone kills one of your family members. There'll be like courts for that and it'll save us all time and life will be more orderly and predictable. And that is just better. So despite the fact they had two very different views of human nature, they came to the same conclusion, which is that we're better under government. Just Locke was more demanding about what that government was gonna be like and it had to protect natural rights. So really Rousseau and uh, it's, it's kind of, an, uh, comes out more of a Lockean legacy. The other main uh, enlightenment philosopher you need to know, which is related to the constitution is Montesquieu. So Montesquieu is a kind of a contemporary with Rousseau and he is kind of like Hobbes a little bit. He agrees that humans are just self-interested and they're gonna abuse power. And really the whole constitution is built on this notion as you remember from the Federalist Papers that men are not angels. That's why we need government. And that's why we have to bake into the government this understanding that there's going to be abuse of power. And therefore we have to have separation of powers and checks and balances between all the branches to prevent that from happening. And so Montesquieu is really um, the father of the idea of separation of powers and subsequent checks and balances. That's Montesquieu, okay? So it's all the Enlightenment thinkers and how they influence our founding documents and how our founding documents um, came to exist and their specific characteristics, okay? Um, yeah. All right. So another key idea of the founders, we just talked about human nature, is a fear of factions. And we've already talked about factions or self-interested groups. And so separation of powers and checks and balances, they help control for fear of factions as well. Okay, um, so just remember how focused on property our founding fathers were. Um, we were a culture that felt that individuals could own property, claim land, unlike the Native Americans who did not think that you could actually own the land. That's like trying to own the wind in their mind, but we did believe uh, our forefathers who founded this nation did believe humans could own land, specific property, and you could defend that. That was a major object of government, a major goal of government. Okay, so moving on to representation. So in the, in the Constitutional Convention, remember that they've tried to figure out how we're going to decide how many representatives there are and how the states get represented. And the first plan was a New Jersey plan, which is very much like the Confederation Congress, which said each state was going to have the same number of representatives no matter how big their population is and um, little states like that because they got relatively more power. And then uh, that was the New Jersey plan. The Virginia plan was large populous states who were like, 
no, dude, that's not fair. We have more people, so we should have more representatives. So they want a representation based on population. The big compromise called the Great Compromise, also the Connecticut Compromise, is that we'll have a two bicameral House of Representatives. The Senate will be appointed by the state legislators, by the state legislatures. They have six year terms. They'll be like the elite House of Congress. They'll be more kind of aligned with the president, who also it will be understood will be kind of an elite person because the Electoral College will make sure of that. Remember, our founding fathers did not believe in democracy, direct democracy. They believed in a republic. And they very much thought we had to rely upon our best men, the enlightened people, to guide the republic. That if you let the majority of the mob or the public have too much say, that they were unpredictable and sometimes full of passion and not reasoned, and therefore they would could take the society in a bad direction. So um, the Senate is going to be one entity that prevents uh, that kind of mob rule because they will be appointed by the state legislatures, not elected. And the Senate will each each state will have two senators, and only a third of the Senate will be up for re-election every two years. So they'll be a more stable body. Then we have the House. The House will be elected directly from the people. They're the only group that will be elected directly by the people. They will represent the population and therefore larger states will have more people to represent them. And so that's representation based on population. And um, they have to dodge some issues about slavery because one, the Southerners, in count, you have to do a census every 10 years to count how many people you have in your state to determine how many representatives you're gonna get in the House of Representatives. The Southerners wanted to count their slaves as people and the Northerners didn't wanna count their slaves as people because that would provide the South with more representatives in Congress relative to the North. Um, and it's, it's a zero-sum game. I think in the original Congress, there were 120 representatives. So for every representative the South got, that was one less the North was going to get. So um, they arrive at the three-fifths compromise. It says that they'll take the population of slaves in a Southern state, the whole number, and then they'll multiply it by three-fifths to determine how many of them get to count in the population of the state for representation. And this would make sure that the North and South had approximately the same number of representatives in Congress. Remember, this has nothing to do with slaves voting. Slaves do not vote for, oh, slaves don't vote, first of all, in American history ever. It's not until they're freed and the 15th Amendment allows black males to vote in 1865, almost 100 years after this time. So the Three-Fifths Compromise is nothing about slaves voting. Slaves don't vote, okay? Um, the next compromise was about the slave trade. The Constitution did, did give the federal government the power to control trade between states and to, like the Articles, uh, the Articles of Confederation did give the power of the federal government to control international trade as well. They started to be afraid, the Southerners, that the, they would outlaw slavery imports. And so they gave them 20 years to import as many slaves as they would like, and the federal government could not ban this international slave trade until 1808. That is a slave trade compromise. Okay. Other really big decisions made in the Constitution is that everything about elections is going to be decided in the states. The manner for carrying out elections, everything. The only thing the federal government says about how elections will be conducted for federal office is about the Electoral College, um, which was actually not in the original Constitution. It was um, the Electoral College was, but the running mates thing came later. Um, and the date of elections. The Congress has said elections will be the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, federal elections in even numbered years. Okay. Everything else about elections, um, how we're going to do the ballot, how we're going to actually vote, if there's going to be primaries, how we're going to pick candidates, um, how the names will be listed on the ballot, whose name comes first, whose name, whose name comes second, all of that stuff will be decided by the states. They also left it to the states to decide who could vote, who's qualified to vote. And at first it was only white men with property. It's a property requirement for voting. Okay. And that also ensured, by letting the states decide who could vote, it also ensured that um, there would be some assurance that like, we wouldn't let the dumb majority all vote because common men who didn't have land could not vote. 
so we've talked about how the Constitution solved the problem of the Articles, but let's just review. It gave the federal government the power to tax. It gave the federal government, since they could tax, they could raise an army, a separate army that would put down rebellions. Um, it gave the federal government the power to control trade between states. That's the Commerce Clause. It gave the federal government um, the power to coin money, so the money supply is going to be fixed. It created an executive branch that's going to carry out the law and enforce the law. It created a judicial branch that is going to uh, rule on disputes between states. So the, the Constitution did solve a lot of the problems of the Confederation period, for sure. Um, so national economic powers is a chart on page 24. So it says, I'm sure it says something about the Commerce Clause. It says something about the power to print money. It says about the power to tax. Um, There's no power, there's no income tax in the Constitution until the 16th Amendment. So taxes during this time period were like um, tariffs, taxes on imported goods, um, and also there could be property taxes um, was the main way that they taxed people back then. So don't think income taxes, that's relatively modern. Okay, um, so personal freedoms, I already talked about those that are guaranteed in the Constitution. Habeas corpus, we already talked about. Bills of attainder means they can't pass a law saying a whole class of people are criminals and imprison them and such. You, you, each person has to be treated as an individual and you have to prove guilt and evidence for each person before you imprison them. Ex post facto means if it wasn't against the law when you did it, you can't be accused of a crime later for doing it. Okay? Um, oh, also in the sixth article, they say that you can't have, you can't be required to have some religion to be elected. Um, they do talk about how in the third article, uh, what treason is. They do define a crime and they do guarantee you a trial by jury in criminal cases. Okay? Um, so how mob rule was avoided. Everything under there is about how mob rule was avoided. Okay, so just remember that our founding fathers don't trust democracy. They want a republic. They think most people are dumb and therefore we should insulate the government from the dumb majority. And Unlike Greece. Greece was a direct democracy. This is going to be a representative democracy. And so we want the rule of law, not the rule of man. And the rule of law means that you elect these representatives, they make laws. The laws stand until they're overturned by a rational judicial branch or something like that. But, or by a deliberative body who changes the law. But what we don't want is for laws to be changed for light or transient reasons that are just because of popularity or unpopularity. Okay, so we have the rule of law in America, not the rule of man. So they only let one house be directly elected and they had only two-year terms. And I tried to talk about the Senate. There's a whole separation of powers. So um, we directly elect the House of Representatives, but they don't have unlimited power. So we insulated the rest of government from the mob, because while the House of Representatives can represent the people, they can't even pass a law without the Senate. So that keeps the mob from actually having that much power. Um, similarly, only the Senate can ratify treaties, only the Senate can approve appointments. So, and the Senate is not popularly elected. So those separation of powers things also limit the power of the House, given the fact that they're the only popularly elected body, okay? Um, the same thing with checks and balances. So, um, not only can only the Senate um, ratify treaties, and that limits the power of the House. Also, um, if the House does something ridiculous, the Senate won't pass it and it can't become law. So, that's a check on the power of the House. Um, similarly, you need to know all the checks on all the other branches. So. How does the president have power over the Congress? Well, he can veto their laws. How does the Congress have power over the president? Well, if he vetoes your laws, they can override it by a two-thirds vote. Also, um, he can't appoint people without the Senate approving it. Also, he cannot sign treaties without Senate approval. Um, tax bills must initiate in the House. So that's another check on the power of the president or the Senate. Um, Remember that the judicial branch obtains or claims for itself the power of judicial review, which means it can strike down laws that are passed by the House and Congress um, and the President. 
But remember that the president has power over the judicial branch because he makes appointments. Remember, the Senate has power over the judicial branch because they approve the appointments. Also, they can impeach um, judges. The House can draw up the charges and the Senate holds the trial. Um, so everybody has a little bit of power over everybody. That's the way checks works. So if there's any abuse of power, then they can fix it. The Electoral College was intended to make sure that if the people elected someone dumb to be president, that the elite people who would be the electors would meet and they could change the will of the people and elect someone more suitable. Uh, we now know the Electoral College, due to state laws being passed, has basically been undermined and, and due to parties. Um, now parties line up electors, and it's very unlikely if anybody gets to be an elector that they're going to change their vote because they're usually party loyalists. But we'll get to more of that later. But that was the intention of the Electoral College, was to keep the people from having power uh, directly. Okay, so just remember, too, that our founding fathers uh, would much rather have gridlock than to have an activist government that acts capriciously and too quickly. And so um, nothing happens fast in the government because of both federalism, which cuts power vertically, and checks and balances, which cuts power horizontally. Okay, so they want a very deliberative and slow-moving federal government. Remember that the default governments that would run the country in case the federal government was gridlocked would be the states. So it's not like they were leaving the country without a government if, in fact, the feds were gridlocked. Okay, so when it came time to ratify the Constitution, the Federalists were for it, and they wanted to market the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists were against it. They thought the states were the federal government was going to be too strong because of the supremacy clause. Remember, there's two clauses in the federal government that make the anti-federalists very nervous. One is the supremacy clause that says all state laws are, are um, subordinate to the federal power. And also the elastic clause, which said that the federal government gets to make all laws necessary and proper. And the anti-federalists were afraid that was way too expansive, that you could justify anything as being necessary and proper if you wanted to. Also, remember, they didn't like the fact there were no natural rights outlined in the Constitution. So, um, the Federalists wrote the Federalist Papers. We've looked at Federalist 10 and Federalist 51 and Federalist 70 and Federalist 78. And um, that needs to be a little more prominently on your sheet. Yes. So let's go over Federalist 10. Federalist 10 is all about factions and how um, we cannot stop the formation of factions because, um, I mean, is this really not on here? No, it's really not on here as well as it should be. Okay, so we really can't stop the formation of factions because they're just a self-interested group of people who, due to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, can form. We have to try and stop the effects of factions, that factions are going to form. And so that's why we have checks and balances and separation of powers. That's why it's good that the Republic is very large because Madison says physically it will be hard for a faction of people to actually communicate across a whole large landscape. It's also good why we have um, elections, that elections are educative and they will help inform the public. Uh, he just has all kinds of reasons why uh, a large Republic is a great way to fight factions. Another one is that there'll be division of power between the feds and the state. So it'd be really hard for a faction to control both levels um, of the government. So he just has a lot of um, confidence that a large republic will lead to a pluralist ideal where there are factions, but that enlightened representatives will balance out all the interests and make the right call. Federalist 51 if you recall, it was all about separation of powers and checks and balances and um, how men aren't angels and that's why we need um, these things and also how as much as possible we shouldn't appoint, the, the different branches shouldn't appoint the other branches and that's why it's weird that we appoint judges but that's why we make judges have terms for life um, is so that once they're appointed they don't have to worry about getting rehired uh, by the executive branch. Then we have Federalist 70 and 78. So I think it's 70 that's about judicial review and it's all about the judicial branch and 
why it's good to appoint them so they'll be qualified. And um, it kind of makes clear that Hamilton thought that judicial review was just assume since the state courts have judicial review, the federal courts would have judicial, judicial review. So that helps kind of explain why it wasn't actually in the Constitution. And then we have Federalist 78 that was all about a energetic presidency, why we should have just one um, executive, um, why he needed to be active and keep be good at keeping secrets, and um, power vested in a single individual, not a council. So if you remember the seminar about that, that's all about the Federalist arguments for the government. Um, remember that the authors were Madison, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, and they wrote like 85 essays that were fairly short put in newspapers to try and sell the Constitution. Um, we've already talked about the Bill of Rights, which limited the government. Um, the Tenth Amendment is important. It says that all powers not given to the federal government are retained by the states. So that sets up the division of power between the federal and the states and the whole reality of federalism. All right, so there's formal ways to amend the Constitution and there's informal ways the Constitution has been amended over time. So the formal way you amend the Constitution is in Article 5 of the Constitution, it says that two thirds a vote of a national body, which is typically a Congress, the, the US Congress, two thirds of the House and Senate. There's another option for a national convention to be formed by two thirds of the states. Okay, that's very rare, but possible. So two-thirds vote of one of these two possible national bodies, that is to propose an amendment. Then it goes to three-fourths vote of the state bodies, and that's more typically the state legislatures, so three-fourths of the state's legislatures will approve the amendment. Or um, the states can form state conventions, and each state has rules for how the state convention option can be exercised. That's how you formally amend the Constitution, um, thousands of amendments have been proposed over the years and only 27 have been passed. It's actually very hard to formally amend the Constitution. It has not been amended since 1992 and some scholars doubt it will ever be amended again because um, of how polarized the nation is. So it becomes more important how the Constitution has been informally amended over time. And um, one is changing norms. So, for example, um, political, uh, now let's go with uh, the idea that um, we've expanded the franchise, that as it's become clear that common men should vote, that black men should vote, that women are equals to men and can be politically active, then those have just changed the Constitution and the Constitution's become more democratic even though that was not the intention of the founders. Okay, so those changing norms in society have led to a changed politics. Technology has changed the Constitution. So when we made the president commander in chief, we didn't know that he'd be able to press a button and blow up the world. So the presidency is much more powerful than it was ever intended by the Constitution and the founding fathers, just by the change of technology. The same with uh, how trade now works and transportation and communication and the internet. There's so much more trade now that crosses state lines. And that means it can all be regulated by the federal government just simply because it does cross state lines. Whereas when the Commerce Clause was originally intended, 5% of trade actually crossed state lines. So just by nature of technology, the federal government has become more powerful than the Constitution originally intended. That's what economic growth is about. Um, the government has just become a lot more complex. When the Constitution was written, it said there'd be some departments. Originally, Washington said there'd be three. Now there's 15 cabinet departments. And so um, the government has just become a lot more complex um, without actually having to amend the Constitution. Marbury versus Madison claimed judicial review for the Supreme Court. And ever since then, court rulings have fundamentally reinterpreted the Constitution. So whereas, before, um, these things weren't clear, court rulings have helped create boundaries and understandings about constitutional law, okay? So that's important. And then political parties have really changed the, const the, the way the government works out outside of the constitutional literal wording, uh, because there's no political parties discussed in the Constitution at all. 
they had no anticipation that they were going to form. And so, um, but like I just said with the Electoral College, now the way that we line up people who are partisans, who are loyal to a candidate in the Electoral College, and so that's just changed the whole way the Electoral College works. And now the, the Electoral College will not overturn the election of a president because all the electors are from the party that of the nominee that has won the Electoral College vote. So the Electoral College is not nearly as flexible as it was intended by the founders. And they haven't amended the Constitution about that, just political parties have come to dominate the process for picking electors through state law. Okay, um, and then we just talked about gradual democratization as more people can vote. Um, there are more officials to elect. So the original House of Representatives was only 120, now it's 435. So there's a lot more people in the House of Representatives to be elected, so that allows a lot more democratic participation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just also all these other processes, like uh, now the 17th Amendment allows us to directly elect senators, and that means the Senate is much more prone to represent the majority um, and majority rule. Um, so those are just some examples of how we've slowly democratized the country. All right, so now we're moving on to federalism. So federalism, I need to hurry this along. This is taking way too long. I'm sorry for that. I'll try to keep these up at just an hour. Um, federalism, in most countries, they don't have federalism where the state has its own authority separate from the federal government to like run its own court systems and have its own um, state crimes defined. And the, uh, more typical is a unitary federal structure where the states only exist to carry out federal mandates and federal law. But um, in our system, there are things only the state can do, things only the federal government can do, and then there's concurrent powers in the middle. So let's make sure we know what that means. So for example, only the federal government can declare war, coin money, assign weights and measures, um, assign treaties, can I say that? Yeah, okay, there's things only the federal government can do. Um, run the post office. Then there's things only the states do. Run elections, marriage, set up education systems. Um, and then there's things they both can do. They can both tax. They can both define crimes and prosecute them within those like criminal definitions. Um, only the federal government can control interstate trade. Only the states can control trade within the state. So um, concurrent powers are the things in the middle where they can both make laws, they can both define crimes, they can both tax, they can, those are concurrent powers, okay? Um, so federalism uh, leads to decentralization. So we talked about that in terms of how, in terms of education policy, uh, since education is done by the states, then we have very decentralized education in America with different graduation requirements in different states. And um, we're not all studying the same thing on the same day and the same way and eating the same things for lunch and those things. So that's an example of decentralization. Um, the courts gain a lot of power because the courts are the ones who are usually settling disputes between the national government and the states. And so that makes the courts the primary arbiter of who has what power, and that makes this, the courts much more powerful. Um, we also get, yeah, I mean, that decentralization, I just talked about that, inconsistent across states. Um, also, the, the federal government lets the states be the laboratories of policymaking, and so if it's not really clear what should be done to solve problems, they let the states try a lot of different things as a means of trying to figure out what the best approach is. Um, federalism allows the state governments to be more responsive to what the realities are on the ground in their states. And so ideally our government should be more responsive and tailored to the people who live there because the United States is very large and geographically diverse. And so the idea is that the feds can't really make law very well for each the farm states and urban states and coastal states and landlocked states and 
so that um, if we let more decision making happen at the local and state level, then they'll make decisions and laws that are more in tune with the local population. So that's supposed to be a benefit of federalism. Another benefit of federalism, oh no, this isn't a benefit, this is a problem of federalism, is that um, it can lead to inconsistent policy. So in the North, for example, and before the Civil Rights Movement, you would have um, segregation based on custom where people just lived in different places, but black kids could go to schools where white kids went. But in the South, uh, since the South ran schools, they created segregated school systems by law. So that's kind of inconsistent. Kids in different parts of the country had different opportunities because of that reality. So that would be an example of how sometimes federalism leads to things that aren't fair. Also, remember we talked about how it's not uh, federalism as a disincentive for states to try and like create programs to improve the welfare, the, the well-being of their population, because if they do too good of a job at that, everybody will move there and it will burden the budget in that state to provide that. So there's actually, federalism leads a lot of states to not do things, because if they're the only ones doing them, then they get burdened with uh, too many people seeking services. So the federal government has actually grown and leveled off in terms of size, it's actually the state governments that are growing much faster. So most people don't realize that. They think the federal government's growing at a constant rate, but it's actually states that have become much bigger and more important in the lives of people. All right, so the distribution of powers is on page 75. It's probably all about concurrent powers and uh, reserved powers are the powers that are reserved by the states. Um, things the federal government can do are called enumerated powers. There's another word besides enumerated. There's enumerated as federal powers, reserved as state powers, concurrent other things they both can do. There's another word besides enumerated, but I just don't know what it is. Um, all right, horizontal powers versus vertical powers. Okay. That's about how we divide power in America. Horizontal powers are how power is divided across the legislative, executive, and judicial branch. That's horizontal division of power. Vertical division of power is between the federal government, states, and local. Okay, so it's just like this thing we looked at in class. This is horizontal division of power, and this is vertical division of power. Okay? So, we slice and dice power. So, in horizontal power, we slice and dice it by separation of powers and legislative, executive, and judicial powers. In uh, vertical powers, we separate it between federal government and state government, and then they devolve things down to local government, and that divides power vertically. Okay? So, uh, the Tenth Amendment I already talked about. It simply says that the things that are not enumerated to the federal government are reserved to the states. The Eleventh Amendment, do not worry about the Eleventh Amendment. It's just too confusing, and I never see it on anything, so I'm just going to let you out of the Eleventh Amendment. Um, it does a pretty good job on the review sheet, actually, of explaining that. It prevents citizens from suing the states, except civil rights. That's a pretty good summary she gave, too. But since we haven't studied civil rights, you don't really know what that means, is the problem. All right, the Supremacy Clause. We've kind of already talked about this in the Sixth Amendment and Sixth Article of the Constitution. It says that there's these implied powers, the Elastic Clause is necessary and proper. McCullough versus Maryland reinforced the Elastic Clause because they said the National Bank was necessary and proper. And so that helped bolster the claim that the Elastic Clause actually is a thing that's going to be used to expand federal power. Um, and there are like inherent powers. Inherent powers are those powers that are just kind of necessary to achieve what's in the Constitution. So. An example of inherent power is if we say that the president has the right to negotiate treaties, then an inherent power is that he will meet with foreign leaders. Because you can't negotiate a treaty without meeting with foreign leaders. Okay, so um, whatever 
has to be assumed as a means of achieving the things in the federal constitution, then those are inherent powers. Um, let me see if I can give you another example of that. So, um, if in fact we have the power to tax and the power to print money, then there must be an inherent understanding that um, the government will hold money in some institution that's necessary, like a bank, um, to actually make that happen. Okay? So, those are examples of just assumed powers that aren't specifically stated in the Constitution, but are necessary in order to carry out the Constitution. All right, then we have Commerce Clause. Uh, Gibbons versus Ivan was that whole case about the ferry being run between New York and New Jersey. And it actually substantiated the claim that only the federal government was going to control trade between states. Um, then in the Gilded Age, we had to grow the, the government's commerce power because monopolies got ever bigger and were able to um, do things against the general welfare. So they were cutting down on competition and prices were going really high and workers were being hurt in their workplaces. And so suddenly the government had to get bigger to counterbalance the power of these monopolies. And so um, at first the courts are gonna be striking down all this regulation, but in time they're gonna realize that um, like the Interstate Commerce Act is gonna be passed. And what it says is that the railroads that run between states can be regulated by the federal government because they're ripping off the people and charging poor people more to use the railroads than rich people. So that'd be an example of how the Commerce Clause, under the Commerce Clause, the federal power gets bigger to regulate businesses um, just to help counterbalance the power of large monopoly corporations. And then we know in the Depression and in the Civil Rights era, the federal power grows again um, in the Depression, because the states were not capable of meeting the uh, needs of the people, so they had to start things like the Social Security system, where we have an old age pension, and they take money out of everyone's paycheck and put it in a trust fund, supposedly, to wait for them until they get to be retired. That's a huge expansion of federal power that affects each and every individual in society. Uh, in the Civil Rights era, then, the federal government grows again. So let's just you know, keep an eye on these dates here. Okay. Yeah, those dates. Um, the civil rights era is when the federal government comes in and becomes defender of minority rights within the, the United States because the states want to continue to segregate blacks and treat them as second class citizens. And the federal government uses the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, particularly the 14th amendment, to force the states to give equal protections to uh, black people. So they become, the, the federal government becomes like the defender of civil rights in America. That all kind of comes to an end in 1968 because Nixon becomes president and Nixon um, believes that the federal government has gotten too large and we need to devolve power down to the states. And um, that is kind of a dog whistle to get white racists in the South to switch over to the Republican Party because he doesn't say it outright, but that does mean that if we give the states more power, then they'll be able to continue to discriminate against black people to the degree that they would like. Um, so, but also, um, he wants to do this revenue sharing thing, where instead of the federal government giving money down to the states and telling them exactly how to spend it, the federal government will just give the states money and let them decide how to spend it. And so that is very popular with governors. and. Um, so revenue sharing is, is a big part of that. Another thing that leads to devolution is the U.S. v. Lopez case, where the Supreme Court finally says, like, you've gone far enough and you cannot involve yourself in these gun-free school zones within states. So those two things really help finally put some limits on the constant expansion of the federal government's power or influence within the states. Okay? Um, since 2000, the degree to which the federal government's power has grown or shrank has been less consistent. For example, No Child Left Behind gave the federal government a whole lot of power over schools, which had previously been just a state thing. 
um, particularly like standardized testing requirements and that all teachers were highly qualified, but that failed. It didn't fail, but the federal government's just decided it's too complicated to try and oversee education. So they've devolved that power back to the states. So what seemed like the growth of the federal government has kind of shrunk. The same thing with the passing of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. It expanded the federal government into providing more and more um, protection for health care. But now that has been kind of gutted by the Republicans and the federal government and Obamacare is kind of, the teeth has been taken out of it. So there's no punishment now for not having health insurance. So a whole lot of people don't have it. So the, the story about the growth of federal government the power since the 2000s is one of like where it looks like the federal government power is expanding, but then it actually kind of doesn't. Um, so to be continued on that one. The states do owe some things to each other. Those are the state obligations. Uh, full faith and credit is one example. So if I get married in one state, I got married in New Jersey, came to North Carolina, they have to recognize my marriage. That's why the gay marriage debate was so controversial and went to the Supreme Court is that states weren't recognizing marriages that had been um, recognized in other states. Then you have extradition. Extradition just means if someone commits a crime in one state and they run to another state, that state has to turn them over to uh, law enforcement. And privileges and immunities means that um, you can't discriminate against people just because they've just moved into the state. So you can't like charge native North Carolinians one tax rate and charge people who just moved in a higher tax rate. Um, so you have to treat people equally no matter how long they've been in the state or even if they were born in the state, okay? Um, so reserve powers are the things that are just maintained to the states and uh, that involves a whole lot. 90% of crimes are state crimes and happen in state courts, okay? So the police powers within the state are actually, most crimes happen within a state and therefore are state powers. I already talked about concurrent powers. Those are the things that both the state and the federal government can do like build a court system, prosecute crimes, tax. Um, those are concurrent powers. Okay, dual federalism and cooperative federalism. Dual federalism was the understanding from about 1787 to the 1930s that the federal and the state government were like uh, roommates or like layer cake where they each had their specific roles and they didn't intervene with each other very much or interact with each other very much. They were kind of in their own separate spheres. Then we know from the 1930s to 1968, we had cooperative federalism, where due to Great Depression programs like Social Security and um, Great Society programs like public housing and welfare, cash payments to the uh, low-income people, they created all these programs and ideas that were mutually carried out by state and federal people working together. And that's why you get like marble cake federalism or marriage, as I call it marriage federalism, where the state and the federal government are very up in each other's business, okay? And then we know that Nixon thought that this was a little bit too much, and so he started trying to devolve devolution of power from the feds and the states, and Reagan continued this trend, okay? Um, and so that's where revenue sharing and U.S. v. Lopez and, um, contributes to that idea which is very much supported by Republicans. And we've kind of been in a conservative era since 1968. The conservative uh, ideas of devolving power to the states have predominated for most of that time period. But it's not super clear, as I just said with Obamacare and um, No Child Left Behind, for example. Okay, um, fiscal federalism. Fiscal federalism is how the federal government wants to control the states and one way they found out they can do that is by manipulating the states with money, okay? So the states become kind of addicted to federal money and therefore it's kind of like just parents do with their kids. Like they can get them to be compliant and do what they want them to do by threatening to take away or control their money. Kind of like Reagan did with the whole seatbelt, um, the whole dropping the uh, raising the alcohol age thing, okay? Um, so if if you want to keep getting your highway money from the federal government, you will raise your drinking age to 21. That's fiscal federalism, okay? Um, so there's different types of money that the federal government gives to the states. One is categorical grants. Categorical, categorical are um, like the National Science Foundation, which is like they want to encourage science 
projects that will help the economy. And so you could put in a project grant proposal and the federal government might throw you some money to do your project. Okay. And there's also uh, formula categorical grants. And those are like, um, if you meet the requirements like social security or Medicaid, like, oh, you have this many people who are under this poverty line and they need health care, and there's this many of them. So we're going to send you this much money to help you provide health care for your poor population in your state. That's a, a formula categorical grant where the feds just send you money based on how many people you have in that formula. Okay, who meet those requirements. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities is just like the National Science Foundation. That's a project grant. Okay, they send money um, um, to, to do art projects or, or help those things. All right, then you have Title I. Title I is formula, and that is the federal government wants to make sure the schools are adequately funded, especially in poor areas. So if you go to school in a poor area, the feds kick in some extra money. That's why some teachers in other parts of the state who are in less um, uh, privileged parts of the state, they sometimes surprise me with some of the computers they have in their classrooms or they have some whiz-bang technology that we don't have because they have federal money coming in. And that's because they meet the requirements for that formula money. Uh, block grants is when the feds just say, hey, we're going to send you all this money and you figure out how you're going to meet a goal that we are setting out for the money. So we want to increase public safety. Here's some money. You decide how you're going to build up your police force to increase public safety with this amount of money. States love block grants the most because they have the least um, strings attached. Okay, it's like free money. Um, what states really hate is unfunded mandates. So a mandate is that you have to do something, but we're not going to give you any money to do it. So two examples of unfunded mandates is like when the federal government said, oh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you need to put elevators and uh, wheelchair ramps on all your government buildings at the state level. And it has to be done by the state, but we're not giving you any money to do it. And it's very expensive to retrofit all the state buildings um, with those things. Another example is No Child Left Behind when the Bush administration said you have to standardize test your kids in these grades, but we're not going to give you any money to develop standardized tests or pay for their administration or grading. That's an unfunded mandate. And so states will ask for waivers and they'll say, like, we can't actually afford this. So will you give us a waiver? And uh, sometimes the federal government does, sometimes they don't. So, um, and then there's conflicted federalism. Conflicted federalism is like right now um, how some states have legalized medical or recreational marijuana, and that goes in direct contradiction to federal law. And so the feds have chosen to, under the Obama administration, just kind of pretend like that's not happening. But then the Trump administration has come in and decided that they're going to pay attention to that because they don't like uh, marijuana, they think it's a gateway drug. And so that's an example of conflicted federalism, where depending on who's in office, you can get conflicted stories about what is or is not going to be done about the behavior of the states relative to the federal government. Okay, so that is the whole review sheet. Actually, I did pick it up for only five minutes late, so hour and five minutes. Do you have any questions? Can you all pose questions? Yes, I think you can. I know there's a delay, so I'm going to give it a lot of wait time, which is a little awful, but it's okay. I'll just blow it off. It just doesn't bang your chalk. All right. Speak now or forever hold your peace. The clock is timed with the seconds on the phone on my iPad. It's pretty cool. 15 seconds, I think my phone's going to be one hour. <laughs>
This is weird. Usually there's lots of questions coming up. There's like a technical problem. Oh, there's a technical problem. Okay, my hair goes on one step. Alright! Time's up! Um, I hope you feel prepared for your test tomorrow. Good luck looking over things. And um, I will see you, maybe, <laughs> assumedly, tomorrow. Okay? Um, 33 multiple choice. I think there's four FRQs. Um, there's no extra time on the test. So you got to finish it in the time that is provided. So you don't want to delay. There will be extra credit. I'll send out the, uh, oh no, I've already sent out a picture of the, I've already sent out a picture of the bulletin board with the extra credit on it, the topics, right? I'll just check the history to make sure. And, um, I will give you 10 extra credit questions based on current events tomorrow as well. Very short answers. Okay. All right. Adios. Good luck. See you tomorrow, hopefully. Bye. Oh, if we don't if we don't have school tomorrow for whatever reason, I will get back in touch. Okay. Thanks. Bye.